you, choir, for that lovely arrangement. My name is Kristen Wells, and I serve as the youth director for our junior high and high school ministry. As Pastor Sarah said, Michelle is out this week on a well-deserved vacation. She came to me a few months ago, and she said, would you be willing to preach on this Sunday? We're going to be going through Ezra and Nehemiah. You can pick any scripture set out of those two books, which sounded like a dream. Um, but as I was camping out in these books, I realized that um, it wasn't as much of a dream as I thought. So we'll, more on that later, but we are going to start with a passage from Nehemiah 2, 11 through 20. This is told um, in the first person from Nehemiah's perspective. When I reached Jerusalem and had been there for three days, I set out at night, taking only a few people with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God was prompting me to do for Jerusalem. And the only animal I took was the one I rode. I went out by night through the valley gate, past the dragon springs, to the dung gate, so that I could inspect the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down, as well as its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the spring gate and to the king's pool. Since there, since there was no room for the animal on which I was riding to pass, I went up by way of the valley by night and inspected the wall. Then I turned back and returned by entering through the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing. I hadn't yet told the Jews, the priests, the officials, the officers, or the rest who were to do the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in? Jerusalem is in ruins, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Come, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that we won't continue to be in disgrace. I told them that my God had taken care of me and also told them what the king has said to me. Let's start rebuilding, they said, and they eagerly began the work. But when Sambalat the Horonite Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it. They mocked and made fun of us. What are you doing? They asked. Are you rebuilding against the king? Rebelling against the king? The God of heaven will give us success, I replied. As God's servants, we will start building, but you will have no share, right, or claim in Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Have y'all ever been to AQ Chicken? Yeah. Um, like many of us sitting in this room, I'm not an Arkansas native, but I was told that AQ Chicken uh, was an institution of North Northwest Arkansas. And so we would go occasionally. Well, about two months ago, after over 75 years in business, AQ Chicken announced that they would be shutting their doors. And I'm actually glad that Pastor Michelle isn't here this morning because when I delivered that news to her, it was very distressing. Um, I think she's still kind of working through that grief. But my husband Wesley and I got out of a Razorback baseball game one Saturday around 4 p.m., maybe about a week before AQ Chicken was closing. And he said, for old time's sake, do you want to go to AQ? We heard it was going to be pretty covered up, but we wanted to be part of history, so we decided to go for it. I went up to the hostess stand, I put our name in, and they said the wait was going to be two hours. And so uh, we're going to throw up a picture of Wesley and I just chilling at the AQ Chicken. I don't know if you've ever sat in line with people for uh, two hours, but honestly, you become this special type of family. Uh, you're in the trenches together, you know, so by the end of it, you kind of feel like you've been through something with these people. And so I started taking some notes on what was going on, sort of people watching. I'm feeling so bad for the wait staff. I just want to go back there and bust some tables because I just want to provide any sort of relief. I've heard the hostess say at least 12 times since we've been there um, five minutes ago, like how long the wait's going to be. And at some point it moves from two hours to three hours. Apparently, there's this group who's reserved a room in the back, and the poor hostess stand is just covered up. And so these people walk in, and I want to make sure they know we're not in line to see the hostess. We just, we, we don't have anywhere else to stand. So um, I said, hey, do you need to put your name in? Um, they said, well, actually, we're, we're with a group. 
I said, is that group already seated? Yeah. It doesn't happen to be the Pontiac group, does it? And they're like, yeah. I said, oh, they're in the garden room in the back. You can just go right on back there. <laughs> What's funny is that I couldn't even, even have told them how to navigate to the garden room. I knew it was back there, but I, I couldn't have made it myself. I've been there maybe four times. And my husband is like, why, Kristen? Why do you have to be the mom of every group we're in? I'm like, guess this is our family, our new AQ chicken family. But it's funny because my proximity here has made me an insider. I'm directing traffic in this restaurant because I've been here just long enough to know what's going on. I saw an older gentleman that was waiting in line next to me. Maybe, maybe it's not kind to call him older. I'll just say he looked like he could have a lot of memories at this house of chicken. And so I knew we were about to have a moment, and I love creating moments for people. So I, I said, how long have you been coming here? I knew it was going to make him feel good to tell me. And he goes, oh, me? This is my first time. I'm like, this guy is a poser. Because as you all know, AQ Chicken practically raised me. This is your first time. This is my fourth time. I'm a legend here. When compared to this gentleman, that's what it feels like, right? It's funny how quickly your understanding of where you belong can change. After reading through Ezra and Nehemiah, I began to understand that we are looking at a pretty dramatic context shift. The Jewish people are moving from exiled outsiders to insiders. And as someone who has been here just long enough to know what's going on, I want to give you the context of our scripture reading this morning. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are situated in history as the stories of the Jewish people rebuilding after the Babylonian exile. This is a part of history that uh, Pastor Michelle alluded to last week. Judah falls to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and many of the inhabitants of Judah are deported or exiled to Babylon. This is the Babylonian exile. And during this time in 586 BCE, the Jewish temple is destroyed, and for the Jews, this feels like God has been put to death. Everything they know has been taken from them, and the place that they have known God to dwell has been laid flat. Well, in 539 BCE, Babylon falls to the Medes and Persians, and King Cyrus of Persia issues a pro proclamation for the Jewish people to return to Palestine and restore the Jewish community. And as sort of a reparation, Persia is going to pay for their temple to be rebuilt. And all the vessels of the temple that were seized by King Nebuchadnezzar all those years ago are returned to their rightful place in Jerusalem. This is a huge win for the Jewish people. And one of the people that leads the return trip, a, a return trip to Jerusalem, is Ezra. And his main mission is to help reestablish com this community, and he's going to do that by helping them rebuild their temple. And then Nehemiah comes along, and his main goal is to finish the job that Ezra has started by helping to rebuild the wall around the city, another really important part of community living for them. Their scripture really came alive for me because I have now been to Jerusalem, and I've walked within these walls. And I could point to some of the gates that Nehemiah refers to in this scripture. As you read through the scripture, you watch the hope of the Jewish people be restored, and it's amazing. It's praiseworthy, and I'm thankful for the faith of the Jewish people in this particular day, in this particular moment in history, their role in the history of the world at large, but also their role in our eventual Christian faith. Because just as a refresher, Jesus Christ was Jewish, and he would have been at this temple that they've rebuilt. It is with incredible certainty that after 70 years of feeling on the outside, feeling forgotten by God, that the Jewish community reclaims with great fervor this idea that God is for them. And you see that in the words of Nehemiah in verse 20 when he says, I answer them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. 
And I think it's easy to follow the Hebrew scriptures and to know who you're supposed to root for. It's the story of the underdog, the struggle of the enslaved Israelite people who are eventually led by Moses through the desert to the promised land. It's the Jewish people displaced by Babylonians that we're taught to root for. And a lot of times that's easy to do. In Nehemiah, the scripture continues to talk about how the wall is being rebuilt. These people come together in unity with this chip on their shoulder that binds them. They will make this place home again. They've been in the trenches together. And as you read on, it says that family by family, they fix the segments of the wall nearest to their house. It's a group project, and it's inspiring. However, there's a small tension here. Because what Nehemiah is saying is worthy of being said. The God of heaven will give us success. But in the next breath, his words are overshadowed as he creates outsiders when he says, we, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any historic claim or any claim or historic right to it. The implication is unmistakably an us versus them mentality. But maybe we can cut Nehemiah a little bit of slack because he's been in the trenches with, the, with these folks and they're finally getting what's owed to them. And so help Nehemiah if anybody is going to stand in the way of what God has seen fit to bless them with. Can we sympathize with Nehemiah? It's not a small deal that the Jewish people are displaced from their homeland. And the fact that they're being granted return and resources to make that return is not enough. We see it all the time in our justice system, right? This is like someone being wrongfully convicted, sentenced to life in prison, and then after 70 years saying, sorry about that, we were wrong. Here's your house back, and um, we're going to throw in all the parts for a 2014 Ford Expedition, but you have to build it yourself. The days of these individuals were numbered, and no amount of money or resources is repayment enough for what has been done to them. The attitude that Nehemiah shares in Scripture should make sense to us. That's a really small tension. What's a bigger tension for me and what I want us to sit with for a second this morning is something that happened during the time of Ezra's leadership in the previous book. While the Jewish people were made to live in Babylon, they understandably took for themselves wives that were not part of the Jewish community. And the Jewish folks who were not exiled that had people moved in on them, they also took wives that weren't Jewish. And as we would expect from many married people of the day, they had children together. And they did this with the full knowledge that according to their tradition, this would have been seen as idolatrous. But they're living in different communities now, and life has to go on. But when Ezra leads the people back to Jerusalem, he calls for them to cast out these foreign wives and children making outsiders of the women and children because suddenly they are concerned with what it means to be a part of their community. I think it may go without saying, but this is not a moment that I find myself rooting for the Jewish people, at least not Ezra, because it just seems so incongruous with who I know God to be. It is a tension of my faith and my reading of scripture that God is for the Jewish people 100%. And that God is also for the people that find themselves on the other side 100%. What I've come to believe about God through the person of Jesus is that God is for everyone. Could it be possible that this scripture is not an instruction for us, but rather a description of what happened to the writer what happened as the writers understood it in that day? Could it be a little freeing for us to realize that even as God was for the Jewish people of this day, they were allowed to get it wrong sometimes? Even if the Jewish people did mess up by marrying people outside of their faith, would a God of unity 
call for the division that Ezra is calling for. Even if these unions were difficult, would it be outside of something that could be used by God? What causes me to wonder this is the fact that in the lineage of Jesus, it kind of speaks to a sort of inclusion as some of its key players are not Jewish. As I've been wrestling with this tension, I've looked to biblical commentators who have been no help. Biblical scholars are bewildered by this as too. What is Ezra doing? So we could speculate all day long, but I wasn't there. We weren't there. What I do know is that since the time of the Babylonian exile, something new has happened. Jesus has come, and Jesus, when he was handed all the tools to build a higher wall around the still oppressed Jewish people, God's people, people that Jesus loved, Jesus, the carpenter, instead of building a higher wall, built a longer table. And he invited all kinds of people to sit at it, Jews and Gentiles alike. As I was sitting at AQ Chicken, back against the wall, making friends with random folks, I was talking to a family who had driven in from Oklahoma. It was a young woman in her mid-30s who was there with her mom and daughter. I said, what are, your, what are your favorite things to order on the menu? There I go again, trying to create a moment. And I know Pastor Michelle would say, you've got to get the chicken over the coals. But this woman said, to tell you the truth, I don't really come for the food. I'm like, you drove three hours to sit in line for two more hours, and you're telling me you don't come for the food. That's what I'm thinking in my head. I didn't say it out loud. I've got more tact than that. She said, I came because when I was little, this was me in my dad's spot. He passed away a few years ago, and I just wanted to come back here one last time and experience it with the people I love. I think our tendency is to see the church as a fancy restaurant with the best cuts of steak and a variety of vegan options where you would only take your fancy friends who know what fork to use when. But I think what makes the church the church is the variety of people that come to dine from all different walks, insiders and outsiders. Maybe our hope should be that the church would look less like a Michelin star restaurant and more like AQ chicken in its heyday. Crowded with regulars and newcomers alike, first timers, people who know where the Sunday school classrooms are and storage rooms, and others who maybe have been here just long enough to point you in the direction of the bathroom. I don't know if you were here last Sunday, Easter Sunday, but it looked not unlike my last visit to AQ Chicken. We were busting at the seams. The back walls had people lined up against them. Last week, we talked about legacy, and Johnny Haney shared about different pieces of our story, including the fact that our church has been rebuilt several times. However, I want to remind you that the walls here are different because they're not meant to keep anyone out. They're meant to give people something to lean against while they're waiting for the table. At First United Methodist Church of downtown Bentonville, we have made a pretty bold statement. Our welcome statement says, FUMC Bentonville welcomes all, because we believe the communion table is God's table we invite everyone into our church family. We welcome and celebrate every race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, marital status, age, physical and mental ability, national origin, economic station, and political ideology. Now I guess the question is, do we? Do we believe that? 
Do we invite everyone? Do we welcome and celebrate? Do we believe in building a higher wall or a longer table? Jesus sure went to a lot of trouble for us to be selective. He sure broke down a lot of barriers for us to only invite our fancy friends. FUMC, there's a lot of hungry folks. Let's get bus on this table. Amen.